It's Saturday at 1 o'clock. I'm Steve Reinhart. I'm your host. I'm happy to be with you. You're with Utah's oldest continually broadcasting radio station. This is AM 630 K-Talk, the voice of Utah. This is the place where Utah's culture, history, politics, and religion collide. And I guess not just Utah, but really anything that has to do with the West. Now, we've mentioned before a couple of times on the program, although we've never done a show about it, a project going on at UC Berkeley that started in 1999 called the SETI at Home Project. If you're into science, probably are familiar with this program. The SETI is an acronym, and it stands for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. It describes a number of activities conducted by scientists around the country and around the world directed towards trying to discover whether or not there is intelligent life in the universe in addition to life here on Earth. And the general approach that SETI projects use is they survey the sky and they try to detect transmissions, radio transmissions from extraterrestrial civilizations or distant planets. These are not UFO researchers. These are legitimate scientists who are trying to see if there are non-natural transmissions. And I've got a guest on with us today who I'm very happy to have and appreciate him coming on on such short notice. He is the mastermind behind the SETI at Home Project, and we'll, I'll get into what it is a little bit more in just a minute. His name's Eric Corpella, and I am going to let him introduce himself because I think he can probably do a much better job describing SETI at Home than I can and, and how he got involved in the project. Let me go to him now. Eric, are you with us? Uh, yes, I am. It's really a privilege to have you on the air, and I appreciate you coming on on such short notice. It was just yesterday we got this interview arranged. Tell us a little bit about your background, your education, and how you got involved with the SETI project. Um, well, thanks for having me on. Um, I'm uh, an astronomer, and I've followed the typical way you become an astronomer is uh, you uh, get both uh, a bachelor's degree, uh, usually in uh, astronomy or physics. Uh, I got mine at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, then you get a PhD following that, and I got mine at the University of California, Berkeley, back in 1997. Um, and I've been at the uh, University of California ever since then. So it's Dr. Uh, Dr. Corpell then? Uh, yeah, but uh, astronomy is a very casual field, so oh, we don't go around calling each other doctor. Uh, <laughs> well, I can, first name I can appreciate basis that. is the standard. Um, so I've been involved in SETI at Home since uh, its inception back uh, in 1999. Uh, actually, that's uh, when it's, our first uh, servers were set up. It it was actually in the planning processes for a bit more than a year before then, and I started uh, on it very close to uh, the beginning. And uh, the uh, problem with uh, SETI is that, uh, in general, we build uh, special-purpose supercomputers to analyze uh, the data coming from radio telescopes, right. and those were not... Uh, capable of doing the kind of analysis that we uh, really wanted to do. Uh, so we were kind of stuck with too much data and not enough ability to look in it for signals. Not, and not some enough smart, ability to analyze it. Yeah. Uh, some smart people, of which I was not one, uh, came up with the idea of, <laughs> of sending out uh, this data to volunteers who would analyze it on their home computers, and that's uh, how the idea of SETI at Home was born. Uh, well, I first became aware of the project in, I think, 2003 when I downloaded the SETI at Home software on my local computer and uh, just let it run constantly 24 hours a day hoping something would happen. Uh, <laughs> it was interesting watching it uh, analyze the data on my, com on my computer. But so you got this idea. Who, who came up with the idea to distribute the the analyzation over all these home computers? Uh, it was originally thought up by someone named Dave Getty, who was a, uh, a student uh, at the University of California, uh, who presented it to his, uh, his professor, and uh, 
they contacted the members of the uh, SETI group, and uh, the rest is history. Well, so we have a commercial break coming up in just a minute. Let me, I want to ask you to describe in detail what the SETI at Home project is, and then we can talk about, uh, you know, what kind of signals you've analyzed and things in a minute. It's a quick two-minute commercial break. Let me throw the phone numbers out for callers who may want to call in and ask you questions themselves, if that's okay. Salt Lake two five four five eight five five Provo four seven zero five eight five five and Ogden six seven zero five eight five five. We've got this two minute commercial break. We're interviewing Dr. Eric Corpella, who's involved with the SETI at Home Project, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Happy to have him on. Uh, give us a call if you have questions or comments. We may take some calls in, in just a minute. He's K Talk. Back in a moment. AM six thirty KTKK. Have you heard about Choose for Health? It's a brand new, delicious, natural, chewable dietary supplement formulated by Dr. David Friedman. Choose for Health is the first and only superfruit, antioxidant, sea vegetable, chewable on the planet. And you'll find out all about it on the Natural Solutions Show this Saturday at noon. Join us this Saturday and learn about Choose for Health, the revolutionary product that is sweeping the nation. Learn why many vitamin pills end up undigested in septic filters and the science behind chewing a natural nutritional supplement. That's the Natural Solution Show, this Saturday at 12 noon. You can also visit orderchews.com. With times being as tough as they are, a good night's sleep has never been more important. Furniture Warehouse has a way to help. Our outlet store at 7144 South Redwood Road has negotiated with name brand mattress factories to bring in truckloads of brand new scratch and dent and top of the line factory seconds mattresses. Sure, there might be some scuffs, but up to 75% off? Who can complain? Save up to 75% on name brand pillow tops, firm, plush, euro tops, latex, memory foam, and twin, full, queen, king, and kelly. California King Beds, all up to 75% off. Plus, as always, Furniture Warehouse offers no payments, no interest for one whole year. OAC. Or we have rent-to-own payment options as well. With 90 days, no interest. Save up to 75% off. Name brand mattresses only at the Furniture Warehouse Outlet Store. 7144 South Road, Redwood. I mean Redwood Road. At Furniture Warehouse on Road Redwood. Welcome back. This is Steve Reinhardt here with K Talk. Let me throw the phone numbers out again. 254-5855 in Salt Lake, Provo 470-5855 in Ogden 670-5855. Interviewing Dr. Eric Corpella, who's involved with the SETI at Home Project. And Eric, I, I'm sorry about that commercial break. These things kind of pop up on us. But I'm going back to our discussion. So so the idea originated in 1998, 1999. For the benefit of our listeners who who don't know what it is. Can you can you describe what the city at home project does basically? Sure, uh, we record data at the world's largest radio telescope, which is in Arecibo, Puerto Rico. Uh, it's actually a big dish that's essentially placed in a valley be- among some mountains, uh, just because this valley was nicely shaped and uh, about the size that you would want for a huge radio telescope. That's about a 1,000 feet across. Uh, uh, we often say it holds a billion bowls of cornflakes, but I don't think ever, anyone's ever <laughs> tried to fill it with cornflakes. Uh, and uh, we, we uh, record data there. It's looking up at the sky, doing astronomical observations for a wide variety of purposes, looking at things called pulsars, doing surveys of the galaxy to look where hydrogen gas is located. And we just piggyback on that, recording everything that's coming from the, da- from the telescope. Uh, and then we take that data. Uh, it gets shipped to Berkeley. And we break it up into chunks that are small enough for a personal computer to analyze. And we ship those chunks out to the computers of our volunteers uh, at last time I looked, we over 6 million people had at some point run the uh, SETI at Home program. Uh, we don't have that many active users right now. It's about 185,000 uh, people currently running uh, SETI at Home on about 750,000 computers. So even right now, you've got 750,000 computers analyzing these data content units that you distribute over the Internet to people. And Mm -hmm. 
listeners to this program even could go to your website, excuse me, sign up for the um, program, download the software, and have their own computers start analyzing these data content units. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, exactly, yeah. And I should mention the uh, website address in case uh, anyone out there is interested in, in uh, joining. We can always use the help. It's setiathome.berkeley.edu. Okay. Or you can go to Google and search on SETI at Home, or even if you just put in SETI, will be one of the top couple of links that shows up there. So this program's been going on for 10 years now or so, or uh, not almost, thereabouts. And I know that initially it was greeted with great enthusiasm. Everyone thought you were going to discover E.T. and all sorts of advanced civilizations. But in 10 years of processing data, what have you discovered? How many interesting uh, signals? Well, uh, the way we uh, designed our uh, search we actually want every chunk of data to return something. That's how we know that the processing is actually working. We don't want uh, a computer to sit there and then send back nothing. If you get nothing, you can't tell whether the computer did it right or not. Right. Uh, so we try and have uh, signals. So we look for things that are really very faint, uh, and uh, we also see things that are extremely bright. But it's a difficult process because uh, we don't expect uh, radio signals traveling to us from across the galaxy to be very bright. So we actually right. uh, have to put a lot of work into it. And since every chunk of data we send out has a signal uh, or records a bit of noise that looks kind of like a signal and tells us about it, uh, it uh, we have... Uh, billions of signals that potential signals that we've looked at uh, but in order to find the things that are really interesting and throw out the things that are just due to random noise or due to interference from a plane flying over or a radar uh, we actually have to be able to look at the same spot on the sky twice and see the same signal Right. So, yeah. So uh, it's it's a common test. If you want to test whether something is really in the sky, you point your telescope at it, and if you see it, great. Uh, and then you look away from it. It should you should no longer see it. Uh, and when you look back, it should be there again. So uh, that really cuts down on the number of things that we can call interesting. Uh, so, it, but there are still places in the sky where we see faint signals multiple times, and we try every, every once in a while to gather up the best possible things and go actually down to the telescope itself and point at that spot on the sky and see whether it's actually real or not. And thus far, we haven't found anything that uh, matches what we would expect to be uh, the characteristics of an in, of a beacon from an intelligent civilization. Now, I understand that there have been a couple of signals that were controversial in that some people thought maybe they could be signals from an alien civilization. These signals, uh, yeah, we, the WOW signal and this other SHGBO2 signal, is, yeah. is, is it possible that maybe you have received a signal and you just haven't recognized it for what it is yet? It is always possible that uh, we're missing something. Uh, the Being able to look at a spot on the sky, go back uh, a day later and uh, see the signal again means that the extraterrestrials need to keep on transmitting for however long it took us to go back and look. Right. So if an extraterrestrial is just... Uh, sending a signal in our direction for 10 seconds and then they stop and never do it again, uh, we'll never be able to detect that as real. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, wa the wow signal is uh, certainly the strongest candidate that uh, anyone has ever seen to date, meaning brightest, not 
uh, strongest, as in most likely to be uh, extraterrestrial. Uh, so the WOW signal was found by a project run by the Ohio State University uh, back in 1977. It mm-hmm. uh, precisely matched the shape. So the way a lot of these surveys, including SETI at Home work, is you look at a spot on the sky, and as the Earth rotates, uh, stars will drift through your field of view and then drift back out of it. Right. And so as it gets closer to the center of the field of view, you expect if there's a real signal there, it will get brighter. And then as it drifts away from the center of the field of view, it will get fainter. Uh, and this signal called the WOW signal uh, fit that uh, profile so well that the scientist that was doing this survey uh, actually circled it on his printout and wrote the word WOW next to it because that's how it got its name. Uh, right. But uh, even then, it was pretty likely that this was not a real signal because the way that survey worked, they actually had uh, two fields of view spaced on the sky so that a real signal would drift through one field of view and then three minutes later would drift through the other field of view. So if it was an extraterrestrial signal, uh, they stopped transmitting in between the time it went through the first field of view and the second field of view. Uh, so so, so it, the second field of view did not pick it up. Right. Okay. Uh, so uh, it got a lot of people excited, and we've always put a lot of attention into that part of the sky. But thus far, no one's ever seen anything that strong again. Okay. Um, what about this other one, SB, H- SHBO2? This was a more recent signal. Uh, yes, this was found in SETI at Home. Uh, it, uh, the name of the signal tells uh, us what kind of signal it is. So the G stands for Gaussian, which is uh, the word for this profile that a signal would have as it drifts through the field of view. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, the O2 tells us what the right ascension, meaning and the plus 14 is the declination. Those are the sky coordinates of this signal. Okay. Uh, and so this is actually a place where we saw uh, these Gaussian profiles three times, uh, which got us really excited, excited enough that we actually went back to the telescope and looked again. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we actually saw it or we thought we saw it a fourth time, although it was much, much fainter this fourth time because we were using, we were able to look at the uh, spot on the sky for significantly longer and we were using uh, a better uh, instrument system on the telescope. Um, but there, there, there's just something that wasn't right about it. Uh, the okay. little b in that name means that, uh, the frequency that we see this signal at was the same every time. But the signals that we actually saw were drifting in frequency rapidly, which didn't make sense to me. Uh, And uh, we've been to that part of the sky very many times and since then, and we haven't seen anything like it. So uh, our best guess is that it was just a random... Uh, noise profiles that uh, we unfortunately saw uh, three or saw four times. Uh, we haven't seen it since. Um, and when- so uh, some people got excited about that. There was a uh, an article in the New Scientist that uh, uh, quoted me as thinking that it was probably extraterrestrial. When in fact, in the interview, I said, "I don't know what it is." <laughs> <laughs> Is there a chance that it was extraterrestrial? Uh, what, I mean, is what, what is your opinion? Um, I really don't see how because I don't. I can't in my brain think of how it's possible for a signal to drift rapidly in frequency yet be stable in frequency. So it it almost has to be a chance occurrence. Uh, we get these uh, 
we get some of these all the time. It's possible that there was uh, a radio transmitter in Puerto Rico. We see radar signals from uh, an air defense radar all the time, and it's possible mm -hmm. that that was misinterpreted as a Gaussian signal if uh, the you know if it came on and shut off uh, over the course of in our case it was takes 13 seconds for the signal to drift through the field of view if it turns on and shuts off in that time frame it can masquerade as a Gaussian uh, or as a real signal so it may just be uh, bad luck on our, on our part that uh, we uh, got this noise source mixed up in our data. Okay. Well, we still have another commercial break coming up, and I want to try to get a caller or two in. So let me just ask you, run through a couple of other qu questions quickly. I wish we had t more time to spend on these. What are the chances you think that we will find extraterrestrial life? And, and can you describe the Drake equation for us? It's this equation, I, I guess, that tries to predict the possibility or the chances that there is extraterrestrial life in the universe. Uh, yeah, the Drake equation is actually, uh, even though there are a lot of terms in it, it's actually a, a fairly simple equation that was thought up by Frank Drake. Uh, it tries to predict the number of civilizations that are in the galaxy that are trying to communicate with other civilizations. Okay, and, and, and what does it conclude, or what do most reasonable scientists think that it concludes? Well, it... Because a lot of the numbers that go in it, like the fraction of stars that have planets and the fraction of those planets on which life develops, are very unknown, there's lots of wiggle room in, uh, in this equation. Right. Uh, so there are uh, some people or some researchers in the field uh, who I have heard say that there are 3,500 civilizations in our galaxy uh, about, uh, and uh, they seem pretty convinced at that, but when I run the ranges of possible values on all the numbers that go into the Drake equation, I get that uh, maybe there are as many as 750,000 civilizations in our galaxy. So, so almost a million intelligent civilizations floating around out there. But we haven't detected yeah, but, any of them. But there's an, the other possibility. So that's the upper end of the range. The other possibility is that uh, intelligent life is so rare that it only happens in one out of every two million galaxies. Okay. And, <laughs> and, and, and on that assumption, what, how many civilizations would there be? Uh, just us. There, so there'd be just uh, at us. At least in our galaxy. Uh, and other galaxies are so far away that it would be very difficult to communicate. The uh, signals would take uh, millions of years to get to other galaxies, uh, and so you, you know, anyone you know, who sent a signal wouldn't be alive to receive the response. Eric, we've got a two-minute commercial break. Can you stay with us? Well, sure. We'll be back in just two, in two minutes talking to Dr. Eric Corpello, who's involved with the, City at, with the City at Home Project. Back in a minute. AM 630 KTKK. Climb aboard for all-season fun at the Heber Valley Railroad. Looking for some fun this winter? Then don't miss our Tuvan train adventure. Take a short trip aboard Utah's 100-year-old railroad, then prepare to plunge down Utah's longest tubing lanes at Soldier Hollow. Great fun for the entire family. Lunch can be included. To make reservations or for more information, call Smith Ticks or visit us at HeberValleyRailroad.org. Space is limited. Tired of missing out on the conversation, Harris Hearing Aid Center of Provo will have you hearing better in 30 minutes. 50 years experience and voted number one best hearing aid center by Reader's Poll for five consecutive years. Harris Hearing Aid Center of Provo offers most nationally recognized brands and their proprietary brand of Symphoria hearing aids manufactured on-site using state-of-the-art technology at half the price of the competition. Harris Hearing Aid Center of Provo is offering K-Talk listeners a free backup hearing aid, a $1,600 value with the purchase of their Symphoria 12-frequency band line of products. The Symphoria technology is comparable to hearing aids, costing twice as much, and you'll receive your backup hearing aid absolutely free. 
Harris Hearing Aid Center of Provo offers free hearing exams, free earwax removal, and free cleaning on any hearing aid. Schedule your free exam today. Call 801-373-6827. Harris Hearing Aid Center of Provo is located in, you guessed it, Provo and well worth the drive. The number is 801-373-6827. 801-373-6827. Welcome back. I'm Steve Reinhardt. I don't know where that Cindy Lauper, Girls Just Want to Have Fun music comes from. I'll talk to them about that. That appears every once in a while. Going back to Dr. Eric Corpella. Eric, once again, it's a real pleasure to have you on, and I wish we had more time. I want to try to get a caller or two in here in a minute. Okay, so the Drake Equation predicts roughly that there's between zero and, in your opinion, 750,000 intelligent civilizations in our universe, or in our galaxy, in our galaxy. Mm -hmm. And we haven't been able to detect any of them. If there really are civilizations out there, why haven't we been able to detect them? And is the fact that we've had such a hard time finding them evidence that there there really aren't any, in your opinion? Well, some people would argue that it is evidence that they aren't there. Uh, and one of the reasons that uh, we do SETI at home is to try and find out, you know, Maybe there are no other civilizations, but if you never look, you'll never find one. Mm -hmm. Even the number 750,000 sounds like a a huge number uh, when you take into account that there are 200 billion uh, stars in the galaxy. You have to look at an awful lot of stars in order to find one of those civilizations. Right. So going into the program, would you have thought that if there were civilizations out there, we would have found them by now? Or is it your opinion that this that the silence that we've experienced with the SETI at Home Project is normal and is to be expected based on how difficult it is to analyze all portions of the galaxy? Uh, given that uh, how difficult it is and that SETI at Home only covers a very, and every SETI project that's happened so far, only covers very tiny portions of the radio spectrum. Uh, it's not, I don't really find it surprising that we haven't found anything. Uh, Do you think we will, given enough time? Um, well, that's one of the things about science is that, uh, I can't really believe one way or the other until I find something. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, are, are you cautiously uh, optimistic? I'm cautiously optimistic. Our technologies are advancing so rapidly that, uh, you know, SETI at home in 1970, SETI at home would have been uh, totally impossible. We didn't even have uh, radio receivers that were... Uh, capable of making the kinds of measurements that uh, SETI at home does. That we are today. Okay. Now, because we're short on time, are there other means of communicating with us other than radio waves that these civilizations might be using? Are there emergency uh, emerging technologies that that might make radio waves obsolete, for instance, that they might be using? Uh, yes, that's uh, certainly something that we look into. Uh, in addition to looking in the radio uh, we and other city researchers look for pulses of visible light that uh, might be coming from lasers. Uh, and some people argue that uh, it's less expensive to build a large laser uh, and uh, attach it to a telescope and try to send signals that way. Uh, so we do actually uh, look for that sort of thing. There's also the possibility that extraterrestrials are using some technology that we haven't invented yet. Well, there's not a whole lot we can do about that until we invent that technology, too. Like neutrinos or these? Yeah, neutrinos uh, are very difficult to detect. Uh, Some people theorize that gravitational waves, uh, which we have not yet detected at all, uh, might be the ways that extraterrestrials would try to attract attention. Okay, and is that because maybe they... Can uh, can exceed the speed of light, it, or would there be ways uh, to use gravitational waves to communicate faster than light? No, gravitational waves also travel at the speed of light, and as okay. far as we know, that's uh, still the maximum speed that we can go uh, or transmit any sort of information. Uh, but gravitational waves, 
it may be that an extraterrestrial civilization only wants to talk to people that are about as smart as they are. So mm -hmm. they might choose a more difficult uh, means of uh, communication uh, so they don't end up talking to people who are still using the equivalent of their smoke sig signals. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's take a quick caller. Let's go to our Salt Lake County line. Caller, you're on the air. Hi, how are you? Good, good. Thank you for calling into the program. This is a very interesting program. The, is there an equivalent, two questions. The first one is, is there an equivalent to the analysis that could be done where you could put spot radios? I, I'm not familiar with the technology. Is there some kind of listening device that you could put on people's homes that would be very specific to one area that you could have all over the world that would be the equivalent? Or is something like that not possible? Uh, there are, actually are people in uh, all over the world that uh, do what's considered amateur SETI, and they do uh, 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 use, uh, like, television satellite dishes, uh, the old uh, uh, ones that are sure. 10 feet in diameter, not yeah. the ones that are 17 inches. Uh -huh. uh, and they build their own uh, receiving systems, uh, and a lot of them are also amateur radio enthusiasts. And they uh, actually, uh, there are some of them that write their own SETI at home-like software to do the analysis. Um, there is an advantage to using a lot of small dishes and in things like the Allen Telescope Array, which is uh, uh, in the process of being put together and uh, uh, something called the square kilometer array, which will use enough uh, dishes that it will have a collecting area of a square kilometer. You can add the signals of these dishes, uh, but it requires very high timing precision and very uh, and very uh, well, a lot of computing power uh, to actually assemble these into uh, usable data streams. So it would be possible for people who are interested in amateur study to get dishes, but I think it would be too expensive to actually try and have people put dishes on their homes to, uh, or some other sort of antenna to try and uh, assemble a huge telescope the size of the planet. Uh, but it's an interesting idea. I actually hadn't considered that. Eric, I wish we had more time. I'd like to check back in with you from time to time and get updates on the program if possible. We've got another guest we've got to move on to on a different topic. I could talk about this for hours, and I think it's fascinating. <laughs> I, wish, I wish I had time to ask you about more signals and other areas of the sky where signals might be found. We talked a little bit about you know, the Fermi paradox, which I think is an interesting notion. But uh, I will get in touch with you and send you a copy of this interview after the show ends a little later this afternoon. Okay, um, great. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Very interesting interview. Fascinating program. I could program. talk about it for hours, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, the SETI program is one of the few things going on in the world that has the potential to drastically change the history of mankind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, or to discover the most earth-shattering scientific discovery ever made. So carry on, and thank you for coming on the program. Have a great weekend. Anytime.